Well, we've got like a ton of material to go over, so <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is our annual PGY3 class lecture. We're going to be talking about double vision. And uh, hopefully everybody has a piece of paper that they can um, have handy for drawing out one of the uh, cranial nerve pathways. I think we're going to not have time for all of them, but we would like to do at least uh, cranial nerve three. So, All right, so this is our first case, and this is a 49-year-old man uh, who came in complaining of double vision and his left upper eyelid was droopy. He does have a history of multiple myeloma, and he had one to two months of progressively increasing diplopia and uh, ptosis of the left upper lid. His double vision was binocular, diagonal, and pretty constant, didn't really seem to change much um, throughout the day. And uh, his uh, other complaints in terms of review of systems, he also had some coordination difficulty with his right arm. And his uh, past ocular history was notable for ocular hypertension, Fuchs, and he's pseudophagic. He's also got, as I mentioned, besides the multiple myeloma, he's got a history of asthma and allergies. And uh, his current medications, he's on infection prophylaxis, what with being still on chemotherapy. Um, and then uh, he's also um, taking some prednisone, five milligrams twice a day uh, for maintenance um, in his uh, remission of his multiple myeloma. On exam, uh, vision was pretty good, 2020 and 2025. Pressure was normal, um, but he, he had some pupil abnormalities. So his right pupil uh, was smaller than the left pupil, and um, he had a four millimeter, um, sorry, a one and a half millimeter anisocoria between the two eyes um, that was equal in dark and light. I'm sorry, let's go back here. Um, his visual fields were full. Uh, his uh, motility exam showed uh, an exotropia and a right hypertropia and primary gaze. Um, and that was um, in the left eye. And his uh, right eye um, had full movements and his left eye was severely restricted in adduction, superduction, and infraduction, um, but with normal abduction. His anterior segment exam was um, unremarkable except for the ptosis. Um, and uh, his neuro exam was notable for the weakness on the right upper extremity, which was pretty subtle. Um, he had a negative Babinski um, and otherwise normal exam. So, um, Anybody want to describe his motility exam? If not, that's okay. We can move on. Rachel? It looks like full abduction, right? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Oh, and by the way, this uh, case is a case that I borrowed from Iowa Grand Rounds. I did not see any interesting cases that looked like this. <laughs> um, so we've got a progressive left cranial nerve three palsy with a contralateral hemiplegia. Um, so anybody have any thoughts about where this might localize? Okay. It's the midbrain. <laughs> So uh, this patient actually uh, underwent MRI after this visit and uh, they found a nice little ring enhancing lesion that I feel like even our colleagues in pathology and any other specialty would be able to identify that nice ring enhancing lesion there. <laughs> so um, let's talk about cranial nerve three. So um, the nucleus of cranial nerve three um, is at the level of the superior colliculus in the midbrain and it's found dorsally, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, we were just talking yesterday about common questions that come up on OCAPs, and um, one of the you know, distinctions that you have to make not only is how the nucleus is organized, but where it's located and where the pathways go. So that's why we thought it might be a good exercise, and we'll get to it later, um, about you know, map, drawing out the pathways. Um, it's broken up into four, uh, sorry, four nuclei for the extraocular muscles, so those are the dorsal nuclei, and then there's also a nucleus for the levator palpebrae, which is, oops, which is this little orange guy right here, and that's actually a little more um, 
anterior. And then um, there, are, there are also bilateral paired subnuclei, um, which are the most dorsal of the nucleus complex. And that's the Edinger-Westfall nucleus, and that's involved in pupillary constriction. And um, as we know, the pathway, um, so we have cranial nerve three exiting the midbrain anteriorly, crossing near the junction of the ICA and the posterior communicating artery, which is important when we think about aneurysms um, in that area, which can commonly cause compression and can cause a cranial nerve three palsy. And then um, the nerve enters the cavernous sinus and travels, travels laterally to enter the, enter, um, the um, orbit. And so here we can see this pathway here. So we're following it. This is the this actually separates out the Edinger Westfall nucleus and then the, the motor nucleus of three. And you can see how they travel here. This is the, you know, together they're they're the oculomotor nerve, and then they're traveling here, and then they're going in through the um, through the annulus of Zinn, and they're coming out here and they're splitting into the two components. So you have a superior division and then you have an inferior division. And um, this, I thought this... Uh, I'll mention to you, um, so that, that book actually um, is accessible online. Um, I really love the illustrations for all the cranial nerves um, and kind of all the kind of the most common pathology. So I'd make a note if you guys are studying cranial nerves in general, this is excellent for kind of illustrations and the clarity of, of how it presents, simplifies things enough, but yet leaves enough detail that, of what you need to know. And this, uh, the presentation's on Box, so you guys have access to all the slides. Um, so this, uh, this diagram... in Health and Disease, that's the name of the, the book. Um, yeah, so anyways, yeah, sorry. This uh, last diagram I just wanted to show is, I, I thought was really handy because it kind of goes through, you know, each of the areas that the nerve can be injured and what kinds of things you see there. So this is, you know, nuclear third nerve lesion. This is where our patient had his injury. Um, and you can actually see three different patterns um, depending on, you know, which aspect of the nucleus is injured. And so you can have either a complete um, ipsilateral palsy uh, along with ptosis and superior rectus palsy. You can have bilateral ptosis. You can also have a bilateral uh, third nerve palsy that spares the lid. And so, and then, you know, again, moving along this pathway, I'm not going to go through this in all the details, but um, you should feel free to revert, refer to this uh, nice little diagram here. And I'm going to move on to Tina. Let's just wait. No, okay. We'll see if we have time. We didn't have a plan to have you guys kind of draw out cranial nerves, but for the sake of time, we may not actually do that. But it's a really helpful exercise in solidifying where things are, so maybe something to do on your own time, or we could do it at the end if we perhaps get there. So, <clears throat> all right, second case, our classic 67-year-old male veteran over at the VA uh, presents with binocular diplopia. My goodness, everything's diagonal. I don't think it's been like that before, but I don't really know. Um, noticed it last weekend, didn't really go away, so we went to the ED. Uh, somehow we didn't get called, but they did a full kind of stroke workup, uh, some big things, so MRI of the brain, an EKG, some labs, really nothing remarkable on any of that workup. Um, and so he came to Opto Clinic for further evaluation. Uh, he has an extensive history of sort of the usual things, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, he had some stents in the past. Um, he doesn't have any headache, he doesn't have any pain, there's no pain with eye movement, he really hasn't noticed that his vision has changed other than the double vision making things blurry. No recollection of this ever happening before seemed to come on all of a sudden. Uh, and then no trauma, hasn't been in a car accident, no recent falls, hasn't been dizzy, bonking his head, anything like that. On his exam, his vision's fine, his visual fields are full. Um, color vision is intact, no red desaturation, his pupils are normal, they're behaving normally. And then this is what his extraocular movements look like. This is also borrowed from Iowa Grand Rounds because I don't have a great compilation of photos like this. Um, who can talk to me about this exam? Any thoughts? Any thoughts at all? First step is which eye is abnormal? Actually, the first step is, well, is the head abnormal? Yeah, that's a great, that's even a better first step. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So kind of drawing your attention first, like Dr. Nofield said, to the, to the head tilt is great. Um, in primary gaze, he is slightly, slightly tilted this way. Um, anyone? There's a little bit of a right hypertrophia. Perfect. So, kind of which eye is looking abnormal in primary gaze, there's a little bit of a right hyper. Very, very good. Excellent. Any other thoughts? We can go to the kind of measurements. So, like Becca said, there... So, and just go back. Yeah. So, this is, this is what you're going to get on your oral board exams in ophthalmology, right? Like, you get, can get some videos, but this is, for this particular pathology, this is what you're going to get. And this is as classic as it comes, and then we'll make it easy for you, right? So, um, and so you are you have to train yourself to look for patterns, right? So when you look at you always look at the primary, and then you look at the up, down, right, and left, and then if you need help, you can look at the other ones, right? So you've got the nine cardinal positions, but you should look at you know primary gaze first and identify pathology. If you see a hyper, you know you know that you must rule out the easy stuff, which is what? Well, this is likely a. Uh, Right, so, so you're looking for a particular pattern, right? So you have a head tilt, that really helps, right? Uh, and then sometimes it's a bit difficult. This is a nice case because you also have, um, you know, nice corneal reflexes to show you what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. But as soon as you see a right hyper, you should be looking, you know, worse in right or left gaze. And they, they didn't quite, I guess, give you the head tilt here, but... So I guess with that then, before I show you measurements, is this worse in left gaze or right gaze? And again, I think paying particular attention to the corneal reflex is really helpful in most of these photos, which is kind of why they're there. So, worse left or right? Great. Worse left. Very good. And then head tilt, which direction does that head look like it's tilting? It's probably worse left, right? But, so yeah, so he's tilted left, which means that he's compensating, right? That right. Compensating correct. <laughs> Uh, so that means that it, it is exactly, you can deduce it from there, but usually they will give you an additional photo where you would see the head tilt as well. Very good. So your measurements of that patient kind of confirm things. You have a right hyper, worse with left gaze, and then your tilt there. So the three-step test is exactly what we've walked through, but I want to make sure we revisit this because it's really important. Um, what does the three-step test tell us? Which yeah, and so what, when can you use the three-step yeah. test? Is the is the first question. Very good. Very good. And it has to be incompetent. I mean, it's a paretic test for paretic disease, okay? So if it's restrictive disease, this com completely this goes out of question. Window. So if you see other features of things like thyroid eye disease or something that, you know, or even Browns or something that you know is kind of restrictive based on history over, you know, how, how other things look, uh, this is use useless. So this is for a vertical, well, uh, a single paretic muscle deviation, right? So really this test was designed to identify fourth nerve palsies, but we have occasional cases where we have like an inferior oblique uh, palsy, for example, that's a single paretic muscle. So it's not just for that, but uh, this is, you know, primarily was designed for fourths, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So whenever you see a right hyper and you're, you're maybe not sure, maybe you're on call and you're tired and you're not thinking very well, if you want an easy way to say exactly like this was said, so a single muscle, is this a fourth nerve or not? And kind of go from there. Beyond that, it's not going to be super helpful to you, but it will at least give you some direction to move off of. And so we already kind of went through this for this patient, but first, what side is the hyper on in primary gaze? We decided in this patient it's in the right eye. Um, which side, so is it worse than left or right gaze? So you decide what in primary gaze was going on. Is it worse when they look to the left or right? And then your head tilt reminds you there. And then some people also include excyclotorsion and cyclotorsion as part of this, um, which I think can be helpful in thinking about what the role of the um, fourth nerve is and sort of what extracular movements that is responsible for, but not super helpful in making your diagnosis. So we already talked through all these things. We have a right hyper. It's worse in left gaze. And then right head tilt seems to be where the patient is comfortably resting in primary gaze. 
Um, so this would be a positive three-step test, which says um, you have a fourth nerve palsy. Great. That's easy. If you got that on call, now you know what's going on. Um, what's our differential? Throw out just a few things real fast. This is a veteran. He's got all these comorbidities. What's the biggest thing that we're thinking? Perfect. Yeah, an ischemic kind of microvascular <coughs> issue. Uh, what if you'd had a car accident three days before? Yeah, traumatic. Another really very common etiology of a fourth nerve palsy. Anything else? Those are two of the, the two of the big ones to think about, so that's great. Uh, the other big one would be a congenital fourth nerve palsy. So if by chance your lovely veteran has brought in a photo of his family uh, for some reason, uh, and you notice that, for instance, they all have this tilt in their nice family photo, that could clue you into uh, a congenital fourth nerve palsy, which wouldn't manifest itself until the patient can no longer kind of control those eye movements and he's older all of a sudden he starts noticing some diplopia. Microvascular in this patient would be the top of my differential because he's got all these comorbidities, it happened all of a sudden, nothing else seems to be going on. If he hasn't had any traumas, you can kind of rule that off and then you can have all these other things, masses, thyroid eye disease, your big stuff, GCA, anything that's going on in the cavernous sinus, all of these things can affect your fourth nerve. Um, but in this patient, sort of our approach tends to be that um, this is a microvascular cause until otherwise uh, deemed anything else. Our approach to how we treat this, what would you guys do with this patient? Is it going to get better? What are you going to tell him? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You expect this to get better on its own. If this is microvascular, it should get better. If it doesn't, within six or eight weeks and you haven't gotten imaging, it might be a good idea to start broadening and thinking about other things. Maybe get some imaging at that point to rule out other sort of disease processes. Um, but it should improve, and so most people I would say would be plus minus in terms of imaging to start with. This guy got a stroke workup, so that's a little different. Um, but it should get better. Uh, and then I guess I'll briefly just touch on the course of the fourth nerve since we're not going to do the kind of drying out or we may or may not. Um, so the fourth nerve comes out of the midbrain. Uh, interestingly, it's, it's sort of at the level of the inferior colliculus and the fibers do decussate. So the trochlear nuclei, once the fibers leave the trochlear nuclei in the midbrain, they run dorsally, they decussate before running their course anteriorly. Um, and that's important because if you have a a central lesion to the nucleus, um, you're going to have kind of ipsilateral versus contralateral problems depending on where that lesion is uh, because those fibers do decussate and they're the only nerve that does that. Um, the other important thing to remember and these questions come up on boards are as it runs, uh, the fibers um, kind of go laterally and into the cavernous sinus but they do not enter the annulus of Zinn, so that's an important distinction to remember as it comes up in boards. If there's something affecting the cone or you're numbing the cone up in a retrobulbar block, your, your trochlear nerve will not be uh, involved. You'll maintain those movements. Um, the trochlear nerve is also the longest, although it has the fewest axons. Sometimes that comes up in questions as well. Passes through the superior orbital fissure to innervate the muscle, but we can maybe talk about its path a little more in detail later. All right. Moving right along. Forward. Always forward. Uh, so my case, so this is a 13 year old girl. This is a case I saw about a month ago uh, when I was covering consults actually. Um, 13 year old girl uh, was, was riding her bike to school one day when she was unfortunately hit by a car. Um, questionable loss of consciousness. Went to an outside ER. They said, actually you look, you look all right so go ahead and go home. Went home, started vomiting, was a little confused, so came back to the children's ER, and they did an overread on the head CT, and they did see some subarachnoid hemorrhage. So she was admitted for observation and then management of her concussive symptoms. She was inpatient for three days and then planned for discharge. Um, and we, we had our classic VA consult. This is our classic inpatient rehab consult of had a patient here for four days, we're ready to discharge her, but now all of a sudden she's mentioning she's had double vision for four days so would you want to come see her right now because we're ready to discharge her um so i go and see her and she says that she has horizontal binocular diplopia 
unsure like if it's getting better or worse because she's been closing one of her eyes the whole time to, to deal with it. No other visual complaints at all, no other medical or ocular history. This is her exam, um, pretty, pretty normal up until the extraocular motility. Um, so her right eye moves completely normally, but her left eye, she's about minus three in AB duction, but is otherwise has full movements. And then just some measurements there at bedside, some crude measurements at bedside. So just such a look at those. And then, once again, not my pictures, but I thought I took it from Iowa, but I, I didn't. A little change up here from the BCSC book. So um, similar to maybe what she looked like, but she she had a little bit of movement on AB duction of that left eye. Um, her anterior segment was normal, and her dilated exam was also normal. Uh, we did review her CT for the onsite hospital uh, with uh, neuroradiology just to make sure there was no orbit fracture that we were missing. Um, and there was no plans for any repeat CT um, given her improvement of overall symptoms. So diagnosis, anybody? And then we'll go through differential. But what was this most likely? Cranial nerve 6 positive. Thank you. And what, what probably caused it? The trauma. Yeah, right, trauma. Trauma. Okay, so, but I think it is important. Um, when we were first talking about how to, how to format this lecture, I think Strav had a really good idea about, well, why don't, why don't we try and format it in the way that we, you know, we go to see a patient and we examine them. How do we really think through this? So, I mean, this is probably most likely, but if we go somewhere and we, we see a patient that has a horizontal binocular diplopia, I mean, really, how do we start to think through this? So what, what could this differential be? Um, I mean, obviously we're talking about cranial nerve palsy, but, but what could this be? It could be like, because of trauma, it could be like um, a orbital hemorrhage of some sort causing, you know, like a, just like a mass defect on yeah, the muscle. Yeah, almost a restrictive component. Yeah. We talked about a fracture, it could actually be causing a restriction by entrapment, um, could be due to swelling, so, so a lot of those things. What, what else besides, I mean, thinking kind of outside the box, if. If we didn't know about a trauma or something, what else do we think of? So think about anatomy, right? So start from the anterior, go to posterior to, to give you a, a good differential diagnosis, right? So what's the first structure that could get affected? What's the end goal? What's the end destination of cranial nerve six? The muscle itself. Okay, so what can happen to the muscle? Trauma. Sure, what else? Yeah, so what's, what do we call that? Mycitis. okay. What else can happen to the muscle? It can become ischemic. More commonly. Not acutely, but you know, again, putting the case aside, but if we're talking about abduction deficit in general, but not commonly involved in this disease, but. Thyroid eye. Good. So, what does it, what, what disease is that? Kids, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so this is this is exactly what I think. I hope. I mean, I'm certainly not good at this, but I, I think this is a really important thing to develop. Is really coming with a broad differential diagnosis. Probably, probably one of the worst things I'm worse at actually. But I'm going through. This is a huge differential, um, and. And we use all these clinical clues, really narrow it down. And, and but I mean, I think this is something that we should be thinking of anytime we see see a patient. So I didn't I didn't organize it quite as well as Dr. Newfeld was mentioning anterior posterior. But um. one thing that really most commonly comes up with a six, um, and when we talked yesterday about um, specifically kind of the ways that the questions are organized on on our exams is uh, uh, Duane syndrome and six are often compared and you, you should be aware of how to differentiate between Duane syndrome and six nerve palsies. So one of the important things is what happens in primary position for patients who have Duane syndrome versus those who have cranial nerve six palsies. What do you see in primary position in cranial nerve six? What did you see in primary position? You see, yeah. what do you see? Yep, you see isotropia. And what do you see in Duane's? Typically, they tend to be straight. 
Yeah, so they usually, their deviation in primary position is way out of proportion to the abduction deficit that they have. So that's the key number one. And of course, you have those other features of Duane's, right? But um, this is one of the kind of the key things and that often comes up. So the, that's the kind of comparison between conditions that we talked about yesterday. That's also important to keep in mind, especially with the six and the Duane's. All right, thank you. Um, so the pathway of the sixth nerve palsy, um, so I tried to kind of underline some maybe important structures to be thinking about as well as through our, uh, like, like within our differential. So exits the brain stem right here. Uh, oops, sorry, hold on. Dang it. So a couple of important structures. So the anterior inferior cerebellar artery travels upwards. And this is something that uh, I think it was Dr. Katz was lecturing last week. Um, and and I, a lot of times in our morning meetings in neuro-ophthalmology, I've, I've heard this structure, this Dorello's canal. I've really, I mean, I've never known what it is and probably still couldn't identify it on MRI yet, maybe, maybe soon. Um, but it's this canal that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Neufeld, but it, it seems to be made by, um, so you have the clivus here, and then you have a petroclinoid ligament that stretches from the clivus over to the body of the sphenoid. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and I mean, Not this clinoid. is, it's... Okay. The clinoid is, you know, the clinoid process where the um, optic nerve is, where the very anterior is, right? Okay. No, I, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, I just pulled this out of an uh, incorrect book, I, I I think it's not a very good drawing, too, because it actually a little bit more correct to what you have on this other schematic because it actually forms almost like a 90 degree angle when it does enter the uh, the Durellis canal so the nerve you mean the nerve itself so this is why it gets damaged so yeah. you know, frequently in trauma so uh you know it's i think this is probably not quite anatomically accurate in general it's but it's like posterior clinoid ligament like, yeah. uh, i'll look it up okay, okay. <laughs> hey i I'm, i trust you uh, so, but I think exactly what Dr. Neufeld said is what Dr. Katz kind of tried to hammer home with us the other day. We, we were talking about pituitary apoplexy and, you know, often the sixth nerve is the first one to be involved because it causes this, albeit s small, but downward movement. And, and you can imagine that if this gets moved at all because of that 90 degree angle that it formed, it's going to get stretched, it's going to get damaged, and so you get this sixth nerve palsy. And then, similar to the other cranial nerves we've talked about, passes into the orbit through the superior orbital canal, um, through the cavernous sinus, obviously, but into the orbit through the superior orbital canal, through inside of the annulus of Zim. So this is not quite right, because like Tina mentioned, the fourth nerve actually doesn't, excuse me, go through the annulus, but. So I chose two incorrect drugs, yes. I apologize. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I was wrong, sorry. Take it back to one incorrect yeah. <laughs> It does seem like Okay, um, just very briefly, um, just because I included them on the differential, so um, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, I know, so this is something that I think we hear about a lot and, and is really important to kind of understand the anatomy of. So this is due to a lesion. Most commonly, we think about it with demyelinating lesions like an MS or a stroke in the MLF or the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And that's what connects the cranial nerve 6 nucleus to the contralateral medial rectus subnucleus. So the cardinal sign of a unilateral INO is, and I, and I feel like I got this on one of the practice questions, but it's slowed adducting, so adducting psychotic velocity in one eye associating, associated with abducting nystagmus in the fellow eye. And the eye with the slowed adduction may have full or limited range of abduction. So that can be kind of tricky because a lot of times we want to say, oh yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't abduct at all, but it really can move quite normally. Um, a couple other points here, you could have a skew um, deviation with the ipsilateral hyperdeviation, and patients may or may not still be able to converge. And the INO is named for the eye with the slow adducting velocity. So just that example there. That's so funny. Just kidding. Just, kidding. <laughs> just wanted to point that out. I was going to show video, but I, I think we'll just skip it since we're trying to hurry. 
Um, you can have a bilateral INO as well, um, which can give you this large exotropy or this wall-eyed look, and that can be from midbrain lesion near the cranial nerve three nucleus. Again, most commonly it's demyelinating lesions or stroke, and then it's always important to think about some mimickers. And then this one and a half syndrome, which was in the BCSC as well. So this is characterized by an ipsilateral, uh, referring to the lesion, so ipsilateral to lesion, horizontal gaze palsy, which is the one, so you cannot abduct or, or adduct, and then contralateral adduction or adduction palsy, and that's the half. Um, and then if there's a cranial nerve seven motor abnormalities involved, then we call it an eight and a half syndrome, just because it's the cranial nerve seven plus the one and a half that we already have. <coughs> This is a one and a half syndrome, so the complete horizontal paresis of the right eye, and then the deduction paresis of the left eye. Is it? Yeah. All right, you guys must be wondering what I'm going to present about because you went through all the cranial nerves. I should just do that. It's a bunch of pictures. Talk about having no time. Um, so this is a complicated pattern of strabismus that we'll talk about. So the 77-year-old woman, she had intermittent binocular horizontal diplopia for six months. It was only present at distance for her, so no diplopia at near. It was worse with lateral gaze in both directions. In her review systems, we asked like the typical questions, some of the questions that we ask for like thyroid eye disease and myasthenia, so no fluctuating eyelid position, uh, weakness, dyspnea, dysphonia, or dysphagia, so myasthenia symptoms. Uh, she didn't have any headaches or pulse synchronous tinnitus or transient visual obscurations or other neurological symptoms so concerning um, like high intracranial pressure. In her past ocular history, she just had cataract surgery, didn't have strabismus before in the past. She had no significant past medical history or thyroid disease. Um, her family had some diabetes and cardiovascular problems. So on exam, the visual acuity, um, pupils, pressure, <coughs> visual fields, still an exam, bad exam, all were normal. But then she, uh, there were some things that were abnormal about her physical exam. Um, let's see here. Catherine, do you want to describe a couple of things that you, you're seeing? Um, yeah. And then Rachel will help her out and we'll jump in. Okay. External photo of both eyes. Um, Dermatochoesis. She has symptosis. Mm -hmm. What's a big thing you notice about her orbits? Our sulcus, it's a deep sulcus. You can see the corneal reflex in the right eye, but not the left. Yeah, it's increased versus on the left. Yeah, maybe a little bit worse on this left side. Okay, so she comes in with this as a static picture, you know, it's just a shot. So, uh, Rachel, Brad, you can answer together what else would you want to test her for? Like, what kind of clinical signs, symptoms would you be interested in looking for? Movements. Her tell. Oh, extra movements, yeah, sure. Yep, you can do her tell. See if they're really, if she's really anophthalmic. Um, what kind of lid test do you want to do? So an MRD one, MRD two. So outside of plastics world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> plastics right now. How do we don't measure those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Uh huh. So, um, so other things you can test for in myasthenia. So when you have someone look up for a long time, and then you look, well, this is how I don't know if you can correct me if this is wrong, but when you look down and then. Straight ahead again. Sometimes the lids go like, "Ooh, what's that?" <laughs> Kogan lid twitch. Yeah. Okay. So for that too. Um, all right. So we get start. Um, what can you test outside the eye movements or eyelids? Like lab wise? No, oh, just just oh. on exam. What muscle is also weak around the eye, other than the extraocular muscles or? Yeah, orbicularis, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's right. really important to check. Yeah. Okay, and you can grade that from like zero to five, as like Dr. Crum usually does. Um, we have them squeeze their eyes shut, and you try to open up their eyelids and see how strong they are on either side. Okay, and maybe our optom residents can kind of work together. It's just a student today. We just want to ask. <laughs> it's fine. Go ahead. Um, cover test? Yeah, um, so do you want to talk about like the eye movements here? Oh, do you see anything abnormal? <laughs> So here's, you can talk, start, about, start with primary. So in primary gaze, it's tough to see because there's no uh, 
according to reflex. Yeah, I don't think Does it look pretty much straight or orthophoric here? It's fairly orthophoric mm -hmm. there. And then on right gaze, we have a uh, narrowing of the palpebral fissure mm -hmm. in the left eye. And it's hard to see. I think movements are about equal in that, that right gaze. Left gaze, there's no retract or uh, narrowing of the palpebral fissure. And movements look equal as well. Yeah. And then on up gaze, we look pretty symmetric. Similar down gaze, so you can see the corneal reflexes here. <laughs> Pretty similar there, and also I'm looking kind of down and up, you know, uh, down and up and right and left. Um, looks like she's pretty full in all these directions. It is she does have a little bit of a lower lid position here, but she's a little bit more tonic on that side anyway. So again, you know where this came from. Um, so she had uh, a left hyper. Um, that was pretty small um, in all gaze directions, so pretty um, competent. Uh, we did a right head, tilt, right head tilt and a left head tilt. Um, just a little bit of a hyper on the left head tilt, right head tilt, sorry, nothing on the left. So we um, also noted this ET. So when there's an ET, um, sometimes we are concerned about cranial, or, cranial nerve six palsies. So would you say this? follows any particular pattern or follows the cranial nerve 6 palsy? No. What about a bilateral cranial nerve 6 palsy? Maybe. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. So, um, but it's also like, pretty rare. And she didn't, she does, she has full movement, so she could still have a little bit of a you know, bilateral. So at near, what do you notice at near versus all these move movements at distance, measurements at distance? So two is smaller than four. <laughs> <laughs> so she is less. Uh, yeah. So it's, wor it's uh, worse at distance than near. Yep. OK. So here's our differential. We talked about these first two. Um, a little bit um, about skew kind of kind of relates to four a little bit because there's a hyper. Um, she does have a little small hyper, and then we can consider that in our differential. Is this just a broken down for you? Because, I mean, these measurements are pretty small. Um, is it a divergence insufficiency? Because what kind of follows a divergence insufficiency pattern here? Or is it distance? Yeah, exactly. So when she's trying to look far away, her eyes are just like still staying kind of converged like this instead of um, uh, diverging. And then um, sagging eye syndrome and heavy eye syndrome. We should rename name these Dr. Cat syndrome um, or sagging eye syndrome. And then unilateral and bilateral six nerve palsies. Anytime there's like a weird pattern to a, a strabismus, strabismus um, DR always mentioned like, Consider thyroid eye disease, myasthenia, Miller Fisher, and Wernicke. So those are like and skew too. Can also sometimes be there if, it's, if there's a hyper. Um, all right. So here's our MRI, and the arrows help us figure out what's going on. So this is um, from anterior here, going posterior. Or I guess it goes this way. So what do you notice about these? What muscles are we pointing at here? Um, yeah. Where are they? Fairly displaced. Yeah. Um, so uh, they're not supposed to be this slow down. They're supposed to be a little bit higher up. And so you can see here, there's quite a bit of space between that superior and lateral right. <coughs> okay. So this is. Diagnosis. Diagnosis syndrome. Yeah, exactly. I tend to forget about this sometimes. I should write out this in the last patient we saw. We saw um, and Dr. Warner was like, "What about the one that Dr. Katz loves?" Um, so I, I wanted to read a little bit more about it. So I, well, I think this is like it's a very a relatively new thing. I think the first time it was ever described is around 2009. So we're talking about a very kind of recent entity. Um, my you know my big suspicion is personally that I think a lot of this is due to a lot of prostaglandin analog use because of fat atrophy that. Um, we see uh, in these people as well as, you know, just aging and the fat atrophy with, associated with that. Um, but um, for sure, with, with the small, um, usually E deviations and a small, um, you know, hyper associated with these, depending on the balance between where the position is in the, how far the lateral recti are, just how far down they're displaced, you have a little bit of a kind of variable pattern. but. Um, certainly an entity and um, just kind of reassuring to tell patients that there is a thing that we can give them a diagnosis of. But, um, I do think that's a little bit more 
recognized now, I think, probably because of a lot of process. Thank you. So let's talk about the pathophysiology, so this really sticks. So we have two things, uh, two parts of the anatomy that are important here. We have the pulley, uh, which surrounds the extraocular muscle, the orbital, and the global layer of the extraocular muscle. You can see that the pulley changes the vector of the extraocular muscle here and here as well. So it changes the way that the muscle functions and moves. And then we have this band that there's a ligament then, so they have the pulley, and the connecting the pulleys are these ligaments. Um, lateral rectus and superior rectus band that's labeled here is the most important one um, for sagging eye syndrome, and that tends to stretch, stretch out. Um, and then this is a nice picture of this um, uh, Fatsman Echo T2 MRI uh, that they published in, in one of like, um, the first, um, like it's the article that we actually, I think is the one print out for patients in, the, in um, uh, our clinic. So the band ligament that connects uh, these two muscles is uh, uh, normal here. It's stretched out and thin here, and then it's completely ruptured here. Um, so the band helps like suspend this uh, lateral rectus vertically, so helps keep it um, uh, vertically um, elevated in space in the orbit, uh, because the inferior there's inferior tension being put on the globe with the inferior oblique specifically. So if the lateral rectus is kind of slipping down to the side. Um, there's a good, and there's also just sinking of the eye a little bit. There's gonna be limited superduction, so we saw that for our patient a little bit. And then there's um, a lateral, ref, lateral rectus tends to have this infraducting action a little bit more, which it doesn't normally have. Um, the esotropia also occurs because the lateral rectus isn't working in its full capacity at this point. So it's like kind of sunken down instead of being nice and kind of parallel. Um, and, and against the globe there, and so it tends to not be able to um, uh, AB duct as well. And then we tend to see this X cyclotorsion because there is like a little bit of rotation of the globe there. Is there anything in terms of like, this is one, um, I guess, example of sagging eye syndrome, but it seems like it'd be fairly variable in presentation, or do we often see just mostly the lateral rectus muscles being impacted? Yeah, so I'll talk about like typical um, findings and like the averages for um, like uh, measurements that we see as well. That's a good question. Um, so we already talked about the age-related <coughs> changes. So as Catherine described, um, there was this hyper, upper, high upper eyelid crease, this deep uh, superior sulci, the blepharoptosis or the uh, lid ptosis that you described. Um, so this is exactly what you were asking, uh, Brad. So you have a small, small vertical deviation, about 10 percent of on average. So these are just the typical findings that have been published um, in, in the, the few articles that have been published on this so far. And you have a small ESO at distance, um, and even smaller at, at near. So, um, and the full ductions, except on superduction, should be a little bit limited. Does that answer it? Yeah. 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 But it can still be a bit variable from there. Um, so this doesn't follow the three-step test, um, and we discussed that. It's not a, a paretic condition necessarily. In this case, um, when we do like the head tilt, you see the opposite usually, because there's the hypotropic eye is excyclotropic. So the third step is opposite of what we expect in a three-step test. All right, so we can do prisms um, if it's a really small deviation. Uh, if we tend to, if patients are like tend, starting to worsen or just prisms aren't working, then you can try surgery. But unfortunately, these patients don't necessarily do, um, you know, very well because uh, 20% tend to have these symptomatic recurrences, um, and they can continue to have these progressive involutional changes sometimes even after surgery because it's just um, uh, continued stretch of the tendons. What's that? What kind of surgery? Like there's, there's just like a, there was a huge list that I found. There wasn't any one particular surgery. It is it hard? I mean, they have to basically uh, position the torque of a, uh, uh, of the um, lateral rectus uh, into kind of the appropriate position, right? So, but without the support of the um, uh, uh, with, of the septum, it's challenged. So they do a lot of posterior fixation for these patients. So that helps suspend the uh, the the muscle, the lateral rectus, in the proper uh, vertical position. So. Um, but they're, they're challenging and that's why their recurrence rate is really high. And, and, and luckily a lot of these patients um, are, just have such small deviations that prism in the glasses generally addresses the issue, so. Okay. So um, I'll actually talk about one other topic and I'm gonna hand it off uh, here. So clinical signs that can help us distinguish between a restrictive versus a paretic diplopia. So um, 
What do we mean by restrictive? Can you guys throw out some examples? So is thyroid a restrictive or a paretic one? So yeah, it's more restrictive. And then um, paretic, it would be like any of the cranial nerves policies that we talked about, right? Um, those are some examples. So with um, paretic issues, we usually see slow, more slowing of saccades. So um, for example, when someone has a cranial nerve six palsy, when we're trying to get them to abduct a bit, they tend to like move slowly in that abducting position, come back, I mean, kind of quickly, but they're moving in that direction is slow. Versus if they're having, if they still have a restriction when they're trying to abduct, they can move quickly to that restriction, they stop suddenly, so it like restricts their movement. Does that make sense? So it's like that innervation is slow and moving it if it's a paretic issue. Um, and then with uh, thyroid eye patients, something that, um, so Brad, you're talking about plastic, so what does Dr. Patel have us do for thyroid patients? I, you check the IOP in primary gaze, and then you check the IOP in up gaze. Yeah, exactly. So we check their, so checking their pressure when looking toward the uh, position of restriction um, can be helpful sometimes because it can increase, well, according to some sources, by like five millimeters of mercury or more. Um, when compared to like primary gaze. So we're actually increasing the pressure on the globe, so the pressure, intraocular pressure increases when there's a restrictive issue there, uh, but not necessarily the paretic issue, because um, there's no enlargement of a muscle or, or restriction or push pressure on the globe. Um, and then force duction is also, so, just, so there's three different things you could uh, potentially think of. So with force ductions, um, what would you see in like, so another example of restrictive is entrapment, right? So you actually wouldn't be able to move the, um, glass, the the globe uh, very well and against the restriction, and um, in paretic issues, the eye the would move fully. It just doesn't move um, when the patient tries to move it. Okay. Um, so I call IOP testing and restrictive strabismus uh, poor man's force duction testing. I mean, it's I, I've done a few force duction tests in clinic and. Let me tell you, people don't like it. So uh, we traditionally, um, you know, try to reserve it for the OR because it's very uncomfortable. But sometimes, you know, really need to make a diagnosis quickly. And